Kingdom of Jerusalem, 1174. King Almeric lies on his deathbed, trying to decide who will succeed him. And it's not an easy decision. He knows others want the crown, and the Sultan Saladin is a rising threat. He has two daughters. Isabella is from his current wife, Sibylla is from an annulled marriage, but still legitimate, and then there's Baldwin IV, his only son, who is 13 and has leprosy. He leaves the crown to Baldwin, and thus begins one of the craziest succession crises in all of history, filled with passion, betrayal, and a musical chairs game of annulled marriages. So get your cork boards, yarn, and pushpins ready, because this one's a doozy. Thanks so much to The Great Courses Plus for sponsoring today's episode. To learn how you can get a free trial and support extra history in the process, stay tuned until after the episode. In our Saladin series, we hinted at the shenanigans surrounding who would become the King of Jerusalem. But because those episodes, which you totally should check out if you haven't already, were centered on Saladin, we really couldn't fit the full madcap story in there. But today, we're going to tell you all about this little historical slice of madness. After the First Crusade ended in 1099, a collection of mostly Frankish kingdoms formed in Palestine, serving as both a political force in the Middle East and a launching point for new crusades. The most powerful of these was the Kingdom of Jerusalem. But as of 1174, it's ruled by a leper. Which is a bit of a problem, since no matter how brilliant or vigorous Baldwin IV is, he won't live long and will never have children. So he's surrounded by plots for his entire decade-long reign. Enter Sibylla. Baldwin's sister, who due to Baldwin's condition, is suddenly the most eligible lady in the Holy Land, and powerful nobles in the Crusader states want to secure her a marriage that will be advantageous when Baldwin finally kicks it. After all, they're eventually going to need help from Europe to stave off Saladin. Enter the Archbishop of Tyre, who sets Sibylla up with a fine young man from France, but who eventually gets cold feet about living in the Middle East and ditches her to go back to Europe. So next, Baldwin arranges a marriage between Sibylla and a guy named William Longsword. I mean, how can you go wrong with a guy whose name is Longsword, am I right? He's tall, blonde, handsome, and good at fighting. So he marries Sibylla, then promptly dies of malaria. Though Sibylla gets pregnant first, giving Baldwin a potential heir. Now, she's the most eligible widow in the Holy Land, and whoever marries her will at the very least get to be regent until the boy is old enough to rule in his own right. And the nobles definitely want Sibylla married again, as Saladin is becoming ever more threatening. And since Philip II of France is still a minor, their usual ally is in no position to help. Jerusalem needs to secure an alliance with a European state who can send troops if needed. Enter Guy de Lusignan. He's the first cousin to Henry II of England, and that might come in handy for the Crusader states. Namely because Henry sort of, kinda, accidentally murdered Thomas Becket, the Archbishop of Canterbury, long story, and owed the Pope a penance. And these nobles figure that if Guy is married to Sibylla, Henry is more likely to discharge that IOU to the Pope by going on a crusade to help them. So Sibylla and Guy tie the knot, have two daughters, and Baldwin raises Guy to the status of regent, to rule in his stead if he's too sick to do it himself. But then Guy starts hanging out with Reynold of Chatillon, who is basically an aristocratic pirate. Reynold came to the Holy Land seeking riches and managed to find it by marriage, torturing bishops, looting allied crusader states, and robbing the peasantry. But he crosses a line when he starts antagonizing Saladin, attacking merchant shipping and pilgrim caravans to Mecca. Even after Baldwin had signed a treaty with Saladin to give the crusader states some breathing room. So when Baldwin tells Guy to punish this murder-happy mercenary, Guy kind of feels like he can't, because Reynold argues that the truce is only between Saladin and Baldwin. Baldwin is furious. So, he deposes Guy, and has Sibylla's son crowned co-king of Jerusalem, passing over Guy entirely. He then puts a clause in his will, stating that if Sibylla's son, Baldwin V, somehow mysteriously dies, the kings of England, France, the Holy Roman Empire, and the Pope will decide who gets to rule Jerusalem next. Then Baldwin promptly kicks the bucket, and his young heir Baldwin V, who also has leprosy, also dies within a year. After a scramble, Sibylla becomes queen, assuring rival nobles Guy will not be their king. Then, as soon as she's crowned, you guessed it, she goes back on her promise and makes Guy king, causing another succession crisis. But with Saladin finally on the march, the Crusader states can't afford to bicker. So they put aside their differences and march under Guy, who raises his banner and leads them to total destruction at the Battle of Atene, getting himself captured while Saladin goes on to cut Reynolds' head off and conquer Jerusalem. 
Then a year later, for reasons that aren't clear, Saladin decides to release Guy. But still intent on reclaiming his kingdom, Guy then shows up to the city of Tyre, one of the remaining strongholds of the Crusader states, and demands that they give it to him because he's the king of Jerusalem. The noble holding the city, a guy named Conrad, who recently arrived from Europe and managed to hold the city against Saladin when no one else could, essentially says, Uh, how exactly are you the king of Jerusalem when Saladin holds Jerusalem? Good question, Conrad. Guy is a king without a kingdom, but he does have an army coalescing around him. So, in an act of desperation, he marches south and besieges the port of Acre. And there, in a stroke of luck, the incoming Third Crusade decides that's where they want to land. Aid from England, France, and Germany gathers around his banner. But there were two problems for Guy. First, during the siege of Acre, Sibylla and her daughters died of disease, which was bad, since it was Sibylla and not Guy who had the claim. Second, Conrad and his supporters come up with a sneaky plan to make Conrad king of Jerusalem by marrying Sibylla's half-sister Isabella, who now has the best claim. Of course, true to this story, even with that plan, there were more complications. A. Isabella was already happily married. B. Conrad was also married. And C. Isabella had previously been married to Conrad's brother, which by church law made them siblings and any marriage would be incest. But y'all, Conrad really wanted to be king of Jerusalem, okay? So, his supporters kidnapped Isabella away from her husband, get her marriage annulled on the basis that she was too young when she was married, and then forcibly marry her to the again-already-married Conrad, all made possible by a pleasantly bribable archbishop. But, and this keeps going, remember how the kings of Europe were supposed to appoint Baldwin's successor? Well, Guy's related to Richard I of England, who was the now-dead Henry's son, and Conrad is the buddy of Philip I of France, both of whom are now in Acre on crusade and want their say. And what of the Holy Roman Emperor? Well, he drowned in a river, so he didn't get a vote. Eventually, they come to a temporary compromise. Guy will be king of Jerusalem, and Conrad will inherit the kingdom after Guy's death. But of course, neither trusts the other, so they both secretly open negotiations with Saladin to better support their individual claims. Because screw holy war, this is about personal power now. Which led to an awkward scene when envoys from Guy's camp and envoys from Conrad's camp accidentally run into each other while both being entertained by Saladin's men. Whoops! Finally trying to solve the problem once and for all, the local barons essentially just decide to hold an election for king. And while Richard tries to rig it for Guy, Conrad wins. Richard, deeply annoyed, makes Guy the king of Cyprus as a consolation prize. So it's over now. Right? Nope. You ready for the lightning round? Here we go. Before Conrad can be crowned, two members of the Assassin's Order stab him to death while he's on his way to dinner with a friend. Richard, who had supported Guy, becomes suspect number one, especially after he gets his nephew, Henry of Champagne, married to Isabella eight days after Conrad's death. Which is why on his way home, Richard gets captured by Conrad's allies in Austria, forcing the English crown to bankrupt itself, paying his ransom. Then Isabella's new husband, Henry, accidentally falls out of a window that he might have survived if a servant hadn't landed on him, and she marries again. This time to, surprise twist, Guy's brother, who then dies from eating too much mullet. Whew, okay, that was a lot. Let's take a step back. The Crusades are often discussed as a Christian-Muslim religious conflict, but if there's a lesson to take away from all this, it's that often motivations were more complicated. The Crusaders' leadership was often as worried about money and power, just as much, if not more, as religious goals. And they didn't just want to win back Jerusalem, they each wanted their guy to rule it. Also, maybe monarchy was a bad idea. But you know what's full of good ideas? Our sponsor for this episode, The Great Courses Plus. They're an on-demand video resource for learning, featuring lectures and courses from the world's top professors and experts from National Geographic, the Smithsonian, and more. Which comes in handy for me because one of my New Year's resolutions was to try to keep learning more about the topics we cover after our series complete. And since I became a bit of a Saladin stand this last month, I've been watching the lecture Saladin, Chivalry, and Conquest from their Turning Points in Middle Eastern History series, which of course has dovetailed into me watching the rest of the series because my brain wants those happy learning juices. And with topics spanning everything from science, cooking, history, photography, literature, or even how to play chess, you're sure to find something you're passionate to learn about. And right now, you can try out their library of over 11,000 video lectures on your desktop, tablet, or phone absolutely free, while also helping support our channel in the process by heading over to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash extra credits. 
I don't want to brag, but Ahmed, Ziad, Turk, Alicia, Bramble, Casey, Muscha, Dominic, Valenciana, Gunnar, Clovis, Kyle, Murgatroyd, and O'Reels One are fantastic legendary patrons. Thank you.